The Global Home Education Exchange really started with a discussion uh, in the year 2010. We should do something outside of the United States and Canada and other places. What's happened since then is it's grown to be more than a conference. We have uh, regional committees uh, that are working with the, the leaders in their national organizations. So there's an African regional committee, there's a, a Latin American regional committee, there's a, a Middle East committee and a European committee that are all working and they, they are organizing uh, regional conferences in addition to the global conference that's, uh, that's happening. Homeschooling is growing in places all around the world. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zan Tyler podcast, where our goal is to help you thrive in your homeschool journey. Let me take just a minute to ask you to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen or watch, including YouTube. And if this podcast has been encouraging to you, please leave us a good review. Each review really helps. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We post a lot of extra content there. I'm excited to have Gerald Hubner with us today. Gerald and his wife, Bev, homeschooled both of their children from kindergarten through high school in their home province of Manitoba, Canada. They began the first homeschool support group in Manitoba 35 years ago, and Gerald went on to become chairman of the board of HSLDA Canada, as well as the chairman of the board of the Global Home Education Exchange. Gerald is an amazing example of a true servant leader and has devoted himself to supporting and encouraging homeschool families around the world and promoting homeschool freedom internationally. So stay tuned. I think you will really be encouraged by this episode of the Zan Tyler podcast. This podcast is brought to you by BJU Press Homeschool. Homeschooling is an exciting adventure we take with our children. One of the most challenging parts of this journey is choosing the curriculum you want to use. BJU Press Homeschool is a curriculum you can trust. All the books, resources, and videos have been designed with you and your child in mind. Their curriculum is educationally robust and rich, taking into account that children have different learning styles, strengths, and needs. Mom, you are in charge. BJU Press Homeschool is here to come alongside and support you. Do you need help with the teaching load or is there a subject you just don't want to teach? Their amazing video courses are available for all grades and almost every subject. BJU Press Homeschool believes that homeschooling can produce a new generation of students who know God, love their neighbors, and stand firm in their faith. For more information, go to BJUPressHomeschool.com. That's BJUPressHomeschool.com. Gerald, we are so excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for being with me. Well, Zan, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here together uh, with you today. I, I remember so many adventures that we've shared in various places around the world. <laughs> we have. You have really taken us on a lot of adventures, I have to say. Um, some we weren't counting on that were unexpectedly delightful. So, Gerald, we're going to talk a lot about your international work later, but right now I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about your family and how y'all got involved in homeschooling to begin with. My wife, Bev, and I, uh, we have been married now for, I need to get make sure I get this right, we got married in 1977, so it's 47 years uh, that we've been married. And I, and I think that's the same as you, Zan, if yes, I remember Yes, it right. is. That's right. We got married in 1977, too. That's crazy. Yes. So we, we live in Canada, right actually in the center of Canada. Um, where we live is 124 miles north of the U.S.-Canada border. And uh, we have two, two children. They're both grown. Our children are age 40, 42 and 40 this year. Uh, hard to imagine that we have children that age. But uh, <laughs> no, our, actually, our oldest granddaughter is just today on her way to a, a discipleship camp college in Pennsylvania. Uh, so she's, she's arriving there today. Can't imagine that we have a I have a granddaughter that's that's doing that, but that's uh, that's how life goes. I know. Uh, we had never heard of home education until uh, our son was ready to to start. Think we were starting to think about kindergarten for him, and he was somewhat developmentally delayed. Our daughter was a was ahead of him, and she was in kindergarten. And uh, we just had some concerns. He was somewhat developmentally delayed, and we thought 
school's good, you know, lots of lots of friends there, but we were pretty convinced that if he went to the school, he would be put in a special class. We didn't have him tested because that's that's not something he really did in those days very much. And um, we uh, we had some friends that also had a son that was he's actually now our son-in-law. Uh, and they had read a book by Dr. Raymond and Dorothy Moore about better late than early. And they borrowed us the book and we read that and we read another one. And we just, we just felt convinced that this was something that we should try with our, with our son. And seeing as we, seeing as we wanted to try it with our son, we thought, why don't we do it with our daughter as well? And it was a, it was a, let's try it for, for one year and see how things go kind of thing. We knew nothing about it. There was no homeschool conferences in our province. And uh, we got started. Uh, we went to a homeschool conference in Minnesota, actually, uh, later that year, and uh, were blown away by the by the curriculums and all the things that were there. Uh, after that, uh, partway through that year, we just said, we really enjoy this. Particularly my wife, Bev, loved uh, to be able to, to teach our children and particularly to teach them how to read because she loves reading. And what started as a one-year experiment turned into a, uh, I'd say, a lifetime uh, decision to go all the way through. So we homeschooled our two children all the way through their school years. And now our our grandchildren, our daughter, uh, married the homeschool boy from down the road. And uh, and they're homeschooling their their four. And as I said earlier, our oldest granddaughter is on her way to college right now. Well, that is so exciting, Gerald. Do you have any um, idea of what year you started homeschooling? Uh, We started homeschooling in 1988. Okay. So Joe and I started in 1984, so kind of the same era. And we started the same way. We read a book by Dr. Moore. And we read Homegrown Kids. And it just was just enough to give us a vision of how education could work differently and extremely in a rewarding way, I guess. And we were the same way. We were homeschooling for one year. And then that just turned into, like you said, a lifetime decision. I love the way you said that. So I know what how you sort of got into homeschooling. What were the things, the benefits, or what caused you to continue to homeschool all those years? What caused us to continue was, I would say, two things. One was the, the enjoyment, the joy, the, the delight of doing things together with our children and as a family. And, and I would say the second thing is, is being able to, to pass on and share and pour into our children's lives the the things that were important to us. As it says in Deuteronomy, uh, we're to teach our children diligently what is on our heart. And it's it's pouring out the real love of our Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis into our children. And we just saw that that doing that in our home as a family made sense. And uh, we just kept going. You know, I love that, Gerald, because sometimes homeschooling can be so overwhelming, especially for moms. You forget the joy part. But if you can remember the joy of being together, then it it makes everything different. You know, it doesn't make the trials as hard and it makes the obstacles doable for the joy set before us in a lot of ways. And so I I really appreciate your share in that. So when you got, how did you make the decision or was it a hard decision to make to continue homeschooling in high school? No, it wasn't a hard decision at all. It was just a natural progression. Uh, We were very convinced that, uh, that home education would not limit uh, options and and probably if there's a concern that people share with me over and over again is I'm not sure I you know yes it's you know I have to teach the advanced math and science and those things and that's one concern uh, we weren't so concerned about that but 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 most people or many people say you know I I want my children to be able to go on to other things college or universities mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure that it's as smooth a transition if they don't get that official government high school diploma. And we had been involved in 
in developing um, entrance requirements and things for universities. So we were pretty convinced that that wasn't an issue. And uh, so we, we were just able to, to continue on and, uh, and it, it worked well our, uh, for both our children. Our, our son started out with learning disabilities and worked his way through those. He still has them. Uh, we found out that he was a, a very strong auditory learner. So when he wrote a test, uh, if, if he read it, he would not do well at it. If, if Bev read it to him, um, then he was able to basically ace it. And even to this day, he's 40 years old, he will sit in front of his computer uh, reading various things, instructions on, on various things, and he'll be reading it, reading it quite quietly, but reading it aloud to himself uh, because he's learned that that's the way he can learn is by reading things to himself. People think maybe he's a bit weird talking to himself, but it works. Uh, he was able to find out how he learned. It absolutely works. I've got a son like that. So this is a funny story. We, Joe and I, we, we had the same sort of revelation when we got to the high school years. Of course, in, in the early 90s when Ty started high school, it was like starting to homeschool all over again. People had thought we had lost our ever-loving minds when we started homeschooling in 84. And then when we went into high school, we had another whole round of how can you do that to your kids? And really, it just those high school years are so precious because your kids have become these um, human beings that you really love having around and they're your best friends and you've done so many things together, you know, that I would just say, don't quit in high school that, you know, the best years are to come. But we, we have a funny story about the auditory learner. Joe and I were picking up the boys. They had been at a Christian wilderness camp in upstate New York that some friends of ours had introduced us to. And then we were hopping, picking them up at the Charlotte airport and taking them with the rest of a, the youth group to a missions trip in West Virginia. Virginia. And one of the rules was you had to memorize the first 13 verses of Philippians 2 to get on the bus to go on this missions trip. Well, two days before Ty was leaving for camp, which was his last opportunity to learn these verses, he hadn't learned them. And I thought, I said, Ty, I don't know where you're going to stay, bud, but it's not going to be with us. And so he, he got out, you know, then it was a little cassette tape recorder and recorded that passage and must have listened to it a thousand times. And when um, when he got on the plane to leave for camp, he could say that backwards and forwards. And the funny thing was he gets to camp and they have this 3,012 award where you do 3,000 push-ups in two weeks and memorize 12 verses that they give you. You get this award. Well, for Ty, 3,000 push-ups was nothing. And he got there and the 12 verses he had to memorize were those same verses he had just learned, you know, so, so that, that auditory learning thing, that's a, that's a strong thing. I love all the stories now, and now we have this in common. Um, so tell us how you began to get involved in homeschooling more than just in your family, in a homeschooling leader, a leadership position. I'm assuming it started in Manitoba. It, it did then. We we started just in our local area uh, where there wasn't really a, uh, a support group or a group of parents that were getting together. So we started by just inviting people to our home and, and uh, starting the discussion of, you know, what can we do and how can we help and what things can we do? And then we, that progressed very quickly within a year uh, to uh, leading or being involved. I wasn't leading um, the provincial organization that was, it, it had a name. It was a group of parents that actually formed uh, an organization to start a private school initially. And then that didn't work. So they, they, they started homeschooling. And, uh, but they, they didn't have any way of, of organizing as far as uh, a constitution or um, or membership possibilities or or just the basics of an organization, and I had been involved in in starting and building a number of different organizations in the uh, in the government and agriculture sectors. So basically, jumped in with helping get that started, and and it, this year uh, marks the it was thirty five years since we started being involved in the provincial Christian home education organization. And uh, we were able to get a new board in place. We stepped off the board in March. And uh, so it was a, 
it was a transition for us to to step away from the provincial organization after 35 years, and we saw it grow to an organization that didn't have a conference and didn't um, really didn't have an organization to uh, a place where they they've been doing conferences continually for over 30 years. And Zan, and you and Joe have been there. Yes, and, yes, uh, it, was it was so delightful. special to have you with us. The first year, I think that things opened up after COVID. Yeah. And, um, you know, Gerald, the thing about you, first of all, I just did this servant leadership talk um, in uh, to some people in San Diego uh, involved with Chia, the homeschool organization there. And of everybody I know, Gerald, you are the epitome of a servant leader. I mean, you have such a heart to serve other people. And it, it's just so obvious in everything you do. And you are just you are just one of those natural born leaders. So I can see where you could pick that up in Manitoba and run with it. So what advice would you have for people that want to start a support group or some type of homeschooling organization and w- or want to be more involved with their state organization if they're in the States? I think when it comes to starting a support group or a support organization, it's, it's basically just a matter of finding someone else that's willing to come alongside with you. Um, you know, I find that various places we travel and we go around the world and and people say, you know, I, I just can't, I can't see getting an organization going because they they have a picture of an organization that has a conference with a thousand people and and um you know the bigness uh, of of what has become but virtually all of those organizations started with one mom and dad and maybe another mom and dad uh, that that worked together and said we can do something with four people and then they found some more and others came around and it, it's just a matter of building it as it makes sense and finding a common purpose um, our daughter started a, uh, her first homeschool support group was a, a group of other uh, parents that had children that were below normal school age. So it was largely a play group. They were homeschooling. Right, I, right. Uh, but it was, that's the way it started. It was a group of people that, that had kids of similar ages and, and similar interests and got together and it grew into a number of other uh, more specific and targeted support groups that uh, that then sort of it morphed into. I love what you said about we shouldn't feel like we have to start off with an organization of even a thousand and a conference. I think scripture tells us don't despise the day of small beginnings. And, and it's funny because I was talking to our dear friends, Roger and Jan Smith last night, it was Roger's birthday. Mm. And I was telling them that I was, you know, that you were going to be on the podcast today and we'd be talking. And so we talked about a number of different things um, that you had done and the way you had impacted us in leadership. And so I, I really believe that being willing to start small is just a great concept for people. So, Gerald, so th- you started the a small group in your area, which turned into this hu- really huge group in Manitoba. Did y'all have legal battles to fight, or were you strictly a support group, or how did that work? Well, we've had battles, I would say, different from North Dakota, which is the, the state that's just right across the border from us. Yes, absolutely. Um, homeschooling has always been legal in our province since the inception of Manitoba as a province since wow. the, year, the year 1870. It's always been a lawful and legislated option for parents to, to choose to educate their, their children outside of the public school system. And, and the wording is at home or elsewhere. It hasn't always been easy, but right, it's always but been, it has been legal. It interesting. Has been legal. That is we, interesting. We have had a, a number of, um, I'd call them skirmishes, where government has wanted to regulate severely, and uh, we've been able to limit that. Um, and it's been a significant effort. I, I remember standing on the steps of the legislature, which is our be our state state uh, legislative building, and the premier of our province would be like your governor um, was was there, and we were talking about something because we were. Uh, going through some fairly significant lobbying right at that point. And he looked over at one of his colleagues and said that nothing stirs fear in the heart of a politician more than the wrath of a mother. (laughs) 
That is amazing. You know, our good friend Tim Lambert said, what's the difference in a pit bull and a homeschool mom? The lipstick. (laughs) You know, know, it it, it was a matter of the last major skirmish we had was in the year 2000, which is a long, long time ago. But what we found was that um, it came down to to one word. It was the word they wanted to use use the word registration, and the previous word in the legislation was notification. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. one word, but it's a significant difference. difference. Significant, yes. We were able to limit that change in legislation, so it still says notification. And there were more hours of debate on that bill in our legislature than there has ever been on any bill before the legislation on any topic. And uh, really? it, was, it was simply due to the, um, the rallying of regular people, moms and dads and kids, and being able to put, you know, put the government, I would say, in its place and them to realize they, they did not want to do this. So interesting. So you um, were very involved first at the local level, then statewide or province-wide in Manitoba. Tell me about making the jump to HSLDA Canada and maybe explain to people what that is. Well, HSLDA Canada uh, is uh, is like HSLDA in the United States. It's a separate organization. Uh, we work very closely together and we appreciate uh, the, the support and the partnership uh, of HSLDA in the United States, but we're a separate organization uh, with a with a board of directors. And uh, uh, I currently serve as the chair. I didn't start as that, uh, but uh, was asked uh, to to come alongside and to join the board of HSLDA on a national basis, largely because of my involvement uh, on a on a provincial basis. Um, and uh, it's it's been a pleasure. I I, I joined that board in 1991. And uh, have been on been involved and currently serve as the chair of HSLDA Canada, uh, and it's it's basically an organization that's there to to stand for uh, homeschool freedom. Uh, we we basically are there to advance the the freedom of parents to choose and direct the education of their children, and uh, do that in cooperation with provincial organizations like the one here in Manitoba, all across Canada. And um, it's a partnership. We can't do it alone. We're there uh, definitely in partnership with, with, with the provincial organizations. Are you seeing an increase in contacts you're getting from homeschooling prop, uh, families that might be having problems with their province in terms of homeschooling? Or has it just been pretty steady over the years? We have hot spots in Canada. And the province of Quebec in particular is always a problem. Uh, Quebec has long been uh, dominated by the Catholic Church uh, as a society, uh, and uh, there was a backlash against that. So any kind of religious or alternate education in the province of Quebec has been viewed not just legally, but but I think overall as as being somewhat of a negative thing. So it's it's been a it's been a challenge. There's virtually no private schools in Quebec, uh, let alone interesting. And so we're. Over over sixty percent of the contacts and the work that we do as HSLDA Canada is in the province of Quebec. Uh, it, it, it's it's legal to choose and to educate your children in Quebec, but it's very difficult. And uh, they're now in the process of putting in place testing requirements, but the testing requirements will be in French. So even if you educate your children, you still have to test in English. Or in test in French. It's in French. Oh, uh, so it's uh, it's a very oppressive uh, education system in in Quebec. And then there's there there's various problems that have happened in other provinces, but largely we've been able to to deal with those and uh, and find ways around them. Uh, but Quebec is the battleground. So. Gerald, so you did HSLDA um, in Canada, and then you got in an, involved in an organization called the Global Home Education Exchange. Tell us a little bit about this. What I want people to see and hear who are listening is that homeschooling has really become a global, not movement, but well, movement. I mean, homeschooling, people are wanting to homeschool all around the world. So tell us a little bit about um, GHEX. The Global Home Education Exchange really started with a discussion 
uh, in the year 2010. Actually, in, in Chicago, there was a group of, of folks that uh, got together for coffee uh, at a conference to talk about what could what was happening around the world. And it, it, and it got to be where there was enough interest to say we should do something outside of United States and Canada and other places. And uh, we started with a conference uh, that we organized in Berlin, Germany, which was the hotspot uh, for persecution, for challenges uh, in, in the world. Uh, it, and it still is. Germany is a very, very oppressive place to uh, for parents to try to try to home educate their children. There, there are some that are doing it, but it's it's a challenge. So that was that was in the year two thousand and twelve, and we had people that came at that conference from certainly certainly from Germany, and we 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 tried to do conferences in places where we can make a difference and encourage yes. people there. Yes. Uh, we we certainly had people from Germany, from France, from a number. of of European countries, but we had people from over, over 20 countries around the world. Yep, standing in solidarity really with the German yep. families very, who very wanted much home was. school. And, yes. And after that, we said we could probably do something more and we continued to work and we, we organized a conference. The second conference was in 2016 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where it wasn't such a critical persecution issue there were some was some legal challenges in Brazil but it was more of a potential uh, the the potential for homeschool growth in Brazil was was immense and it and it's flourished since then we've been able we were able to encourage it significantly and uh, we mounted another conference in 2018 in Russia where where you and Joe were there Jan. yeah that's the first one we attended the first global conference we attended yep and we were going to do one in Philippines in 2020, but uh, this little bug kind of interfered with that. So we had to go online for that year. Our next conference was actually this year in Manchester, England. And uh, I, th I think it was a success. What's happened since then is it's grown to be more than a conference. We have uh, regional committees uh, that are working with the the leaders in their national organizations. So there's an African regional committee. There's a, a Latin American regional committee. There's a, a Middle East committee and a European committee that are all working. And they they are organizing um, regional conferences in addition to the global conference that's uh, that's happening. And then we have um, a research um, encouragement arm of GHEX, where we're uh, encouraging research uh, in home education, academic research uh, around the world. And that's grown to be where this year in Manchester, England, we had researchers from, from over 20 countries uh, that uh, were presenting their research at the conference. The research, along with other things, has really flourished. Homeschooling is growing. Um, uh, in places all around the world. Yeah, it, it's so remarkable to me to to have been in Manchester, England. And first of all, I want to comment on the research, and then I want to talk about the you know just the number of internationals who have such a heart for homeschooling. But that research arm, headed by my dear friend Deb Bell, uh, PhD, uh, and a previous homeschool mom, that has been so significant for me to see that research done in all these other countries and not by Americans, but by the the scholars they have in their own countries, which I think makes it more powerful in a lot of ways. And I, I just think that's remarkable. It was such a huge part of the conference this year and growing bigger every year. I mean, Gerald, y'all had so much insight as a board to really begin to develop that because now it's gone from something small, like we were talking about in Manitoba, to something that's very influential, I think. So I'm always interested, you know, we, we see our good friend Godfrey from Uganda. You know, we talk to people from South America. I talked to a, a French woman or married to a Frenchman. She's actually an American whose child was just, had been picked up by the police. They were, I mean, this, her husband had been decorated as a French hero in war. And they, they just didn't like the fact that they were homeschooling now. I guess there's a new crackdown. Picked up her son and wanted to interview the son separately. 
And um, so they were able, I think, to attend that interview after all. But they've moved to the States or are making plans to move to the States. So we need to pray for our brothers and sisters and our, our friends and families around the world who are undergoing um, some persecution like that. Thank you for joining Gerald and me today for part one of this two-part episode. If you want to get in touch with Gerald, you can find him on Facebook or email him at gerald.hubner at me.com. You can find me at zantyler.com and on social media. Thanks so much for being with us today and may God continue to bless you and your family in your homeschooling journey. Until next time, bye.